Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are in the world, and welcome to this episode of Hit Talks Honest Inner Truth Conversations. And Hit Talks, Hit Talks is the talk show where we have eight speakers speaking for eight minutes from eight different perspectives on hope on inspiration and on transformation, speaking from the heart, speaking from whatever comes to them at that specific time, with no intentions, no, inge no agenda, other than just speaking from their heart about hope, about inspiration and about transformation, which is absolutely amazing. And then we had some fantastic speakers on Hit Talks Live. And as they were speaking for eight minutes, it was like, oh my gosh, we need to know a little bit more about these people. And this is where Honest Inner Truth Conversations was then created, where we can find out a little bit more about these amazing speakers that have been on Hit Talks Live. And I'm super excited today to have one of the previous speakers from Hit Talks. We'll put the link in below of when he spoke at the last episode. But we have Dr. Carl Callerman with us today. And it is just so exciting when you have people from all over the world. Carl is in Santa Fe at the moment. And just look at Carl's bio. There's so many, there's so many things that we can talk about here. But Carl has a PhD in physical biology. And this PhD was from the University of Stockholm. And he's a senior researcher in the School of Public Health and at the School of Washington in Seattle. He focuses on identifying toxic substance, substances <laughs> in the human environment. And he spent the last 25 years focusing on understanding the meaning of the ancient Mayan calendar. So the ancient Mayan calendar, and also part of his quest is that he's also lectured in 25 countries. He's written several books, and these books have been trans translated into many, many languages. And I love having this opportunity to speak with Carl because as somebody who has birthed Hit Talks through the energies of the ancient Mayan calendar and something that I actually embody, something that I love and something that I'm learning from as well, having somebody with Car like Carl on Hit Conversations, I'm absolutely so, so, so blessed. So Carl, thank you so much for being part of Hit Talks and also being part of Hit Conversations. Thank you very much for being here. Oh, thank you for having me, Vicky. How are you today? Uh, absolutely amazing. And I'm super excited to actually have this conversation. And I just yeah. really want to get into it, Carl, because you know my love for the Mayan calendar. And, you know, it's, 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 it is just, it's so vast out there. There's, you know, there's, 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 there's so much when people research about the Mayan calendar out there. I just want to ask you before we start and we start going deep, and I know this is going to be a long conversation, but what really made you get into, you know, in, into research in the Mayan calendar? Yeah, um, you know, in, in retrospect, I would say that this is sort of a mission that I was born with. Um, and, and uh, you know, afterwards, I have found signs in my birth uh, chart, you might say, that indicates that, that that was the case. But then, you know, I, I'm born in Sweden, and um, so it wasn't just obvious how, how would this mission be triggered, what, what would set it in motion. And uh, what really happened then was that in uh, 1979, um, I did a backpacking tour in uh, Mexico and, and Guatemala, and, uh, which was a different kind of a thing in those days com because the internet did not exist. And, and it, sort of, you, you, it was much more like you jumped into an adventure and you really didn't know what, where you would end up. And then I was still a graduate student working in a laboratory in, in Stockholm and with, with that sort of a rigid uh, mentality that any laboratory needs to have, um, and uh, and I, but I, I I really wanted to go there and uh, um, had to force my mentor to to let me go off time, so to speak, not in the in summer but in the October, and then um, I flew over there and I knew that I was going to go to a school uh, to to learn a little bit of Spanish. And um, 
unbeknownst to myself, and it's just uh, uh, reflects the kind of lack of uh, knowledge that existed in, in those days, or the lack of communications. I ended up in Mexico City uh, on the day of the dead, uh, late later the night. And you know, some of you might have seen uh, uh, the Bond movie. Uh, the latest, or I, I don't know if it's the latest, but one of them where, where they portray the uh, uh, Day of the Dead in, in Mexico City. And, and it's really a, a very, very chaotic thing. And so I, this, this uh, sort of a, a very scientifically minded uh, graduate student um, from Stockholm, and, and Sweden is very rational, so to speak, um, ends up there and all these families were going from uh, one part of the town and to the villages outside of the city, and and because they had these, they've had these uh, dinners together with their uh, deceased ancestors at the uh, in the cemeteries and, and so forth, and uh, immensely chaotic, and. Uh, 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 after having had to bribe my way through the police and a false taxi driver, and I don't know, I ended up in this city where I was supposed to uh, go to school and came there at, at midnight and uh, with, uh, with skeletons hanging from the light poles and uh, uh, the, the bakeries were full with these skulls where, you know, they would write like Carmen on the foreheads of these, and they, like if their deceased Aunt Car uh, Carmen w w had passed away, they would have that kind of a skull with them. And, and um, um, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't my mother's street anymore. And, um, um, uh, but I, you know, I soon really uh, got to love the country. Uh, in, in, in Mexico in general, um, but then, also, when I was taking a third-class train down to uh, Merida in the Yucatan Peninsula, I, I just fe felt that all the indigenous peoples and, and so forth that I, I met, I, I just became more and more uh, feeling that th there is something special here for me. It's not just visiting another country that I want to study as an outside observer or something like that. And... Um, uh, what also would happen would be that some person, some native person, for instance, in San Cristobal Las Casas, uh, which has this big uh, market with uh, different tribes of Maya coming down, uh, would just come up to me and, uh, and say, es para ti, you know, th this is for you, and give me a little amulet, and then disappear. Um, and... Uh, so what that meant, what it gave me a feeling that they saw something in me that I had not seen and really, but, but it was strong enough to, for, to, for me to, to feel that this is how I'm, uh, this is my purpose somehow. I couldn't really say how, but I, I really felt uh, uh, this is, was my spiritual home. And um, of course I did get in, uh, also in contact with the calendar, I learned a little bit of these uh, uh, little symbols that they had been using for a couple of thousand years. And uh, uh, I, I just intuitively sense that when it comes to the uh, time and, and uh, the phenomenon of timing, then they were right. And, and our, our calendar was wrong, basically. But it was, you know, long before... This is also, I should say, this is before any uh, spiritual people in, in, in the modern world or, or in the West, as we usually say, um, uh, had taken an interest in the Maya. Uh, not at all at that point. The, uh, people, nothing was really known uh, among people at, at large. Um, but, and so I, I didn't do anything. I continued and, and then I later became uh, a senior researcher at the University of Washington in Seattle, and then I could more frequently go down to uh, um, Mexico and uh, would spend weeks on end in, uh, in the Temple of Inscriptions in Palenque, sort of just absorbing 
something I didn't know what what it was I was supposed to uh, make of this or what I was supposed to uh, absorb, but I was just called to go down there and 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 uh, um, assimilate something that I, I thought was part of my mission. So that's that's how that's essentially how I got into this. Amazing. How about you? How about you? Well, it's amazing. It's an amazing journey. And um, the first time I came across the the, the the Maya really was in the Celestine prophecy book. Have you read that? Oh, sure. Yes, and I know uh, uh, James Redfield very well. Yes. Actually, we we were together in in uh, Merida uh, in 2012 at a conference. Yeah. Yeah, a great book. And I know that that book has, has impacted quite a lot of people's lives. You know, when you speak to people, a lot of people, a lot mm -hmm. of people do, you know, do talk about that. And so it kind of sparked my interest a little bit. And, you know, and then when you kind of do the research, research into it, but you've done many books on, on the, 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 the Mayan calendar and that as well, haven't you? So how deep, how deep, you know, if we just say in a, in a very brief overview without going in, into too much depth for any of the viewers that have not come across any of the, the, the Mayan calendars. So the, the viewers that are actually saying, oh, I've heard a little bit about it or I know nothing about it at all. Now, I know that there's many that, you know, that there's, there's many calendars out there. I think there's 21 Mayan calendars, isn't there? But just tell us a little bit about, you know, for people that are very, very new to this uh, in, a, in, in, a, in a brief overview, say, you know, I saw in the, well, sorry, read in the Celestine Prophecy about, you know, the, the, the spiritual connection of the Mayans and how they kind of evolved and, you know, and, and, how, and how, how they were managed to be very high vibrational beings. But tell us a little bit for people that don't understand this at all. Yeah, <clears throat> so uh, I think that it's a fundamental uh, difference between the Mayan calendar and the rest of the calendars on our planet, really. Um, most calendars, uh, like the one we uh, in everyday use, the Gregorian, uh, the, the, calendar, the, the Gregorian yeah. calendar, is based on the mm, revolution of our planet around the sun. And uh, many other calendars are moon-based, like the, the Jewish and the uh, Muslim calendars are based on the revolution of the moon around our uh, planet. And so these calendars are based on the, the movements of physical objects. Uh, what, what we would talk about as based on Newtonian physics, if you want to uh, look at it from a physical point of, of view. Uh, the Mayan calendar is, is different. It is not basically, I mean, they did take an interest in some astronomy and, and a certain planetary orbits and so forth. But at, at its core, the, the sacred calendar of 260 day is not based on any such physical uh, um, cycle. And that's an enormous difference, really, uh, because it, it reflects the fact that it's, primarily it's about the evolution of consciousness. It's based on the evolution of consciousness, which is entirely different from basing a calendar on the physical movements of, of, of physical objects like our planet or, or the moon or, or, or the sun. So that, that's, that's an enormous difference. You know, just consider the fact that there is a 260-day calendar that you can't explain by any such physical uh, um, uh, uh, process. And that tells us uh, that is different. And, and then we will have to look at how then do these uh, 260 day energies, how are they connected to our evolution of consciousness? And as you said, there's many, many uh, calendars uh, that the Maya used to uh, use. Um, uh, and um, uh, uh, but, it, it, but they actually, m most of them are part of a common system. So they are interconnected in a way that uh, makes it easier uh, once you get into it. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I think that's, that's the bottom line in, in what makes the Mayan calendar stand out. Uh, 
But, I, you know, I also want to add something here. Uh, you know, some people might think of, of the Maya as a relatively small people. I, you know, I, I think today they're probably somewhere around 20 million that speak language as Mayan. And um, in ancient times, they might have been 10 million or so. But the other way of looking at it is, is that, yes, okay, so it's a relatively limited group of people. On the other hand, you would say, I would say, and I think most people would agree with me, that in terms of Native American peoples, uh, in terms of the whole Western hemisphere of our, our planet, this was the most intellectually advanced of all these peoples. So that's, they're sort of spearheading whatever was going on uh, among the Native American uh, peoples. You know, it's like... Um, yeah, it's, they, they play a little bit like the role of the Greek when, when it comes to European civilization, that where, where we tend to go back and see that, okay, the Greek had some idea here, here in the past, and, and now we are developing this idea t today. And, and the Maya have somewhat of a similar role there. They were ahead of their uh, the other Native American peoples. And sometimes, you know, there is some people that go ahead before and, and that's what they did. So, the, 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 you know, it, it, this difference that I uh, talked about, that it's not just about physical objects moving around, um, uh, that, that uh, it, it's also more than that. It is the, the, the most advanced uh, uh, intellectual structure of the Western Hemisphere, indigenous to the uh, in, uh, Western Hemisphere, I would say. Yeah, and I, I love, you know, I, I work with the calendar every single day. I work with the calendar with my clients, my tribe every single day. And knowing that, you know, the 260 days are the, the, the days that, you know, women give birth and, you know, it's, 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 it's the whole, it's the whole kind of, you know, one first trimester, second trimester, third trimester to give birth and the 13 days and every single energy is different. And, and for me personally, you know, just to explain to the viewers, since the last, you know, at least two years on a daily basis that I've been embodying the energies of the ancient Mayan calendar and, in, and, and understanding the, en the energies as, as well. It's just, it, it just gives you the, I want to use the word power, if that makes sense. It gives you the power, it gives you the belief, it gives you the the, the, the understanding that because we are all energy and knowing that we are supported by energy just gives us the, I would say the power and the comfort of, of knowing that we have these supportive energies around, around us. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. And, um, you know, to elaborate a little bit differently, it, it conveys not only power, but also the, uh, once you get into it, you become aware that you're part of a meaningful process, a directed process, an evolutionary process. And, and that's a huge difference from sort of looking around and seeing that everything that happens around you is an accident and an accident and, and w without any underlying meaning. You know, whether things are good or bad is, is one thing, but uh, at least with the Mayan calendar, you, you will see that there is inherent in this creation a kind of a directed process that we are part of, uh, and, uh, and that gives meaning to life. Yeah, synchronicity, that's the thing. I've, I've found that since I've been with it, as I say, and embodying it, the the word synchronicity comes up into my field more than like so many times a day. And it's just like, how can this happen? You know, the synchronicity and you, you've got to trust, haven't you? That, that there, there is no such thing as coincidence. As you say, you, you know, you, you look at your, your makeup for instance, and then you know that you're on this journey for, for a reason. Yeah. 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 And, and synchronicities is a, is a good uh, phenomenon to bring up here because it tells you that, you know, you're not in alone in being influenced by these energies, these processing evolutionary uh, energies. In, in fact, in principle, everyone alive is influenced by these um, processes. And, and then what happens is that because it's a collective 
e evolution really that, that the Mayan calendar describes. Once in a while, things will synchronize and we will share our pa paths and, uh, and so forth. And it, again, that's, that comes back to the same thing, that uh, things do not happen uh, accidentally, they happen as part of a larger process. I would say. As I, as I say to many people and I say to my children, everything happens for a reason. And, you know, we know ourselves, Carl, that, you know, our connection and we speak very often now that, you know, everything happens for a reason. And but when you understand that and you appreciate that and then you look at the energies and you look at the signs and you look at the synchronicities and perhaps you look at the makeup, of perhaps why we're here and what your sign is and what my sign is. And, you know, people within our field, we can then look at a bigger picture to know that we are here to to create collective consciousness and use the energies to support us to actually help us with that collective consciousness to help raise it do you agree yeah sure yeah yeah yeah, so there, yeah there, there, there are many different levels to these calendars the calendar system as you said earlier is composed of many different calendars but they those calendars also reflect different states of consciousness like a uh, and and uh, um, that that uh, allows for us to direct our own evolution uh, by tuning into particular uh, calendar waves. Yes, definitely, and that brings me on to the the, the next topic that we I'd, I'd like to discuss. And I think it would be amazing because this is a. a a topic that follows follows on from this as well but i loved your book the um the nine waves of creation and it's you know it's it's all about the quantum physics it's all about the destiny of humanity just you know and i find it fascinating when we talk about the waves and we talk about if anyone that has looked into the the, the mayan calendar and you know the 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 consensus, oh, the world is going to end in 2012, you know, and there's, the, you know, we haven't got time to go into all of that now. But I love that, I, you know, I lo I'd like you to share us with us a, a little bit about, you know, about the waves and us now being in the ninth wave, because I think that is super important for, for, for our viewers, really, to kind of understand the consciousness of the waves. Yeah. So, you know, I mentioned earlier how I got to feel that I, my purpose was very much linked to this uh, particular uh, uh, culture of, of Mexico and of the Maya. And, um, and, but more specifically, I think my mission was about sort of translating the, uh, the cosmology, the ancient cosmology in particular of, of the Maya into a language and a worldview that's meaningful for most modern people uh, living in, in Europe or Japan or, or uh, anywhere else but the, the Maya land, really. And so it, it really has to do a lot of translating uh, what's usually perceived as mythology into science. And... Um, the, these are really two modalities of, of capturing the same uh, reality. You know, people that are into ceremonies and uh, uh, spirituality, they will often prefer the uh, mythological language. Uh, to me, coming from a scientific background, I also want to know is what they are saying, is that true from a more... Uh, um, scientific perspective. So it, it, much of this is to sort of juxtapose these different languages, the scientific and the mythological. And, um, and, and the nine ways of creation is a good example of, of that. Uh, uh, because you probably will not find any ancient text that specifically talks about the nine waves of creation. What you find is that um, in, in ancient times and in, the, and in Mexico and, and uh, Guatemala especially, people would talk about a divinity that they talked about as the plumed serpent. In other words, a flying serpent. And uh, it's not a, you know, you would think, oh, a serpent, that cannot be important. Uh, and and it's, was that just a minor deity? No, 
uh, in, in the, the, the most important, the most spectacular pyramids that the ancients would build was dedicated to this plumed serpent. And um, for instance, the, the, what used to be the world's uh, largest pyramid by volume, the one in Cholula, uh, is dedicated to the plumed serpent. The, the central uh, um, pyramid in Teotihuacan is dedicated to the plumed serpent. And the, the central pyramid in Chichen Itza has this spectacular light show every ex equinox where the plumed serpent descends into the earth. So this is a major, major, the major uh, divinity um, among the ancients. Now, if that should be meaningful, they cannot just talk about a snake, so to speak. So what is it? Well, you know, if you think of yourself as being in a world where you have no uh, internet, you cannot sort of plot sine waves uh, or, or trigonometric tables to, to plot them or something like that, and yet you want to communicate that it's a sine wave movement that uh, exists and shapes our lives, then you would probably choose a serpent as the best symbol of such a wave. So, uh, it, translated to modern scientific language, this plumed serpent is a kind of a, of a quantum wave. And uh, the, it, it's not just one wave, actually. They built their pyramids in nine levels, uh, each reflecting a particular state of consciousness that was developed by a wave. So the, the pyramid in Chichen Itza uh, is, is really about nine uh, plumed serpents developing a higher and higher consciousness on, on the part of, of humanity. So this is a, an example of, of how I work. And um, uh, with translating the mythology uh, to uh, um, modern science. And, um, you know, of course, if, if I'm part of a sort of a fire ceremony with Mayan elders or something like that, I don't go into this translation to uh, a scientific language. I, I just take at fa face value whatever they, they are using or, or as uh, symbols of spiritual entities and so forth. But I do know that for the modern audience, uh, I, uh, which I, is the best word I can say. I usually don't talk about um, uh, 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 modern civilization as Western, because the real Western people, they, that, that's the Aztec and the Maya and the Dakota Indians and so forth. That's really the true West. But anyway, you know what I mean when I talk about the modern people. And uh, for, for us, you know, we may want to, we, we are schooled in a scientific tradition, more or less, at least we spend a lot of time in schools learning that. So that is what I want to communicate then, how you translate this to, to, to see. And once you do that, pretty much everything uh, makes sense in, in terms of the evolution of the universe. Anyway, you slice it, basically. Yeah. So the ninth wave, the, the ninth wave you talk about in here about it being in unity. Share, yeah. a, little, share a little bit about that because of the, of the, of the stages of, the, of, of, of moving from the fifth wave, which is, you know, where people can understand a little bit more up until the ninth wave. It's, it's quite a short period of time, but then the ninth wave is more about unity. Yeah. Well, it, so... Of course, a question that might arise in the heads of the listeners is then, where does this plumed serpent come from? You know, obviously the, the Maya, and, and I should say, uh, uh, most ancient peoples had a very significant role for the serpent. Um, not always positive, uh, but mostly positive as a creator god, so to speak. And, and that's, that's true from Australia uh, and uh, all the way to, to the West, uh, so to speak. Um, and uh, uh, these waves then, if you uh, listen to the inscriptions of the Maya, they originated 
in the center of the universe, the, the heart of the sky in the center of the tree of life, something they called the place of creation. And it seems that the way they looked upon this place of creation, where the uh, creator gods were uh, harbored, you, uh, they looked upon that as a place where uh, sort of slides with different geometries were put up. They raised up a sky, they raised up a slide, you might say, and then that slide, that particular uh, geometry that organized the minds of people everywhere in the universe was projected onto the universe. And then it would land uh, among other places here among us. And uh, so once we download the, the geometry that that particular wave is transmitting, then we start to look at the world in, in, in a new way. Our consciousness changes because our, actually our brains are being reorganized uh, by these different uh, uh, quantum states, these different uh, geometries that were emitted from this place of creation in the center of the uh, uh, tree of life. And uh, then uh, the, the, the whole story of evolution of uh, our planet, and I'm sure that's true for the entire universe really, is about the shifts between these different geometries, these different quantum states. And uh, some of these uh, states have been, um, been quite dualistic uh, and actually have, it sort of it seems like it comes with the territory of creating civilization, that it has to be a dualistic, uh, uh, um, like a yin-yang polarity that creates uh, civilization. And what that means is that that duality has also mean, meant that um, a world of inequality has been projected onto the world. And of course, if people feel that, okay, here comes this message, this geometry from the cosmic center, from the gods as they would perceive it, then they, they feel it's legitimate, you know, then I should do something about that. If you get a, 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 um, a geometry that's eight partitioned, which they describe for 5,000 years ago, well, then you go out and build pyramids that are even, either four or eight divided, so to speak, uh, because that seems to be what the gods want us to do. And uh, now we don't have that immediate contact anymore, that feeling that this comes from the um, center of the universe, but the ancients certainly did. They, they, saw, believed, they believed in it, didn't they? And that's... That, they that's believed they, in it. They, they trusted yeah. in it. And I just want to just jump in there before you go on, Carl, if you don't mind, because I love you talking about the, the, the number eight, as, as we've spoke about before, as, you, as you're just talking about, because, you know, as, as I said, you know, this is where you open yourself up to accept the, the divine download. You open yourself up to, to listen. When you connect with the energies, you're given your, you know, you're, you're given the, your, your, the allowance to, to accept these downloads. And when you're talking about the eights, and you know this was even before we spoke, you know hit talks, you know the divine download of it being eight minute, eight speakers for eight minutes on eight <laughs> different perspectives, you know it being yeah. four women, four men, polarities, you know this yeah. you know, hit talks was divinely downloaded. It was it was divinely downloaded in February. Absolutely, with me not knowing the meaning of eight, me not really knowing at the time about the polarities of four women and four men, I was just. As, as, as let's say as not not a servant, but I was just a uh, a student of just following the the ancient Mayan energies and and enjoying the process and enjoying the journeys, and then I'd opened myself obviously to this divine download, which was the eights. So you know, when you're talking about this power of the eight, it just came in as thinking, ah, amazing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it is. Um, but then, you know, as I understand this, you know, I, I, I'm not clear at all about what kind of intelligence there is 
in this place of creation. You know, some people will say it's God, and uh, yeah, maybe so. I, I, I can't argue against it. I'm not convinced that it is like that. Um, others, you know, the, the ancients would talk about the gods, like it was a bunch of different uh, energies there. And, uh, um, you know, today people talk about the reality as being a simulation, uh, which is more in, you know, in accord with the modern digital world and so forth. Uh, I, I, but anyway, I, the, the, my work doesn't go into that center of the universe. I, I can't tell that. But I, I think for a thinking person, it's still obvious that there is some intelligence behind it all. And... Uh, it becomes even more clear when you look at this uh, sort of progression um, of the uh, ascent of the pyramid going through these different quantum right. states. There is a certain logic to it. And, uh, so you, uh, and I do think that the, the, the eight partitioning that came 5,000 years ago and created civilization, it, it, the, the, it came with a territory. It had to be dualistic. And, uh, you know, the good side of this is that uh, it created a, a world with civilization. Um, the reason we can sit here and talk <laughs> on quite a different distance, so to speak, for, for if, if nothing else. Um, but the bad side was that it created a tremendous inequality. And uh, you, you might also say that people in those days, uh, they were quite cruel, qu quite, quite brutal, uh, and so forth. And the reason is, I think, that since they had downloaded a duality and felt that this duality was divinely given to them, they would project it onto all others as well as to nature and uh, even to themselves. And it all became a world of dominance, really, where some would dominate the others and sometimes express a, lo a lot of cruelty uh, uh, as we know from ancient times, there's no real exception to that, or very few anyway. Now, then uh, on top of that, there's been then three other waves activated. And uh, the last one of these is the ninth wave. And uh, I look upon the purpose of this particular ninth wave as... Uh, uh, as one of creating unity, recreating a unity that existed before the duality uh, uh, of civilization came into existence. And so it's, a, it's like going through unity, from unity, through separation and back to unity. And the ninth wave is one that, that is meant to bring us back to unity. And uh, uh, w which means something more than just sort of being a good person or, or being, even being a compassionate person. It's really about uh, sacrificing some of your individuality for, the, uh, for the, a new state of consciousness that is based on, on the we state of, of it's not just you know it's not just having a good relationship between two in the individuals it's actually that both of those individuals tune into the uh, the, the state that is still being uh, emitted from the center of the universe uh, that propels us into a path of unity s shared unity so it's it's really it's not something you, you get to by being a, a, a more spiritual person in an individual path, you might say. It's something you come to after certain preparations of having climbed to the higher levels of the, of the pyramid and then taking the quantum leap. And a quantum leap is not more of the same of what you were in before. It's a new, something that you were not into. And to that kind of shared unity, the kind of we state that, that the nine waves gives us actually since uh, um, nine years or 10 years into the past. So what's a quantum leap then? So let's say for instance, to our viewers, they're doing that, they're doing that, uh, they're following their spiritual practice and their journey and they're spending time, you know, 
really connecting and being. And so, so what's the, obviously the quantum leap will be different for everybody, but just to explain for, for our viewers that are perhaps, you know, wanting to, you know, transform to, to, you know, to, to really, you know, support the collective consciousness and be in unity, then how would they, or is, is there a way for them to actually quantum leap? Yes, the, there are. And uh, in, in this regard, I think uh, uh, Patricia Albert, who has developed something she calls the Evolutionary Collective, and she lives in, in the Bay Area in the United States. Yeah, she's on, uh, Hit, I think, she's on the next episode of Hit Talks. Yeah, okay. And, uh, and she's developed a sort of practical exercises, you might say, in order to cultivate the, this quantum state to the ninth wave. Um, th th that's probably the best, I, I, the most immediate thing that I would refer the interested person in. Uh, but I would also recommend that people start following the ninth wave. Uh, it, it's ups and downs. And uh, today it, it so happens that we're in the beginning of an 18 day long down turn, a valley. So we just shifted. Yesterday was uh, a peak, and today it is uh, uh, a valley. But that's, that helps, in a sense. It, it, those that follow this will become familiar with the energies of the ninth wave, and they will... Uh, um, uh, become uh, uh, convinced to themselves that this is a real phenomenon. And I think that's a big part of what, what people need today to, to see that, as we talked about earlier, uh, these waves are, are processes that are real and, and creates meaning for, uh, for life. Um, and uh, I think, you, you know, um, also on an intellectual level, uh, it, it helps to uh, follow the ninth wave. Uh, uh, over time, you become aware of its reality, and over time, it also means that you uh, will start thinking in terms of more unified uh, worldview or a, or a direction towards unity. Um, but um, I also you know, want to strongly recommend uh, Patricia's uh, work because it gives you uh, an immediate um, experience of how to cultivate this quantum leap. Yeah, amazing. And you can see this in your book anyway. So there's, you know, it explains, uh, explains a lot more in, um, in your book about the ninth waves of creation. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, Carl, I'd like to just briefly jump over to your next book, which is about um, psychedelics, which I find absolutely fascinating. And we've spoken about that uh, together ourselves anyway. So, mm -hmm. you know, the, about the, the belief in psychedelics. Now, there's a lot out there of people thinking, oh, it's bad, you know, you shouldn't be doing things like that. And what... You know, you've actually put quantum science and psychedelics together here. Do you just want to give the viewers, you know, we'll talk about the pineal gland after, you know, I'm, I do a lot of work to deactivate my pineal gland. You know, you do that with diet yes. and, um, you know, eating the right foods and, you know, the detoxes and things like that, which we can talk about at a different time as well. But just tell us a little bit about your view as far as psychedelics are concerned. Well, um, you know, there, there basically are, in the modern world, there have basically been two waves of psychedelics. Uh, the first one you might talk about as essentially peaking in the 60s. And um, uh, it, it all comes after the discovery by Albert Hoffman in 1943 of LSD. And um, it, then uh, as a result of that, in the 1950s, psychiatrists, in, especially in, in the U.S., started to explore you know, what, what would be the potential psychiatric use of this uh, substance, because they uh, realized, or he uh, already realized, that this is something that means a complete uh, uh, change in your mind structure, at least temporarily. Um, 
but but then what happened in the 60s that is that it became it came out of the laboratory so to speak it escaped the laboratory and then you have the whole world of the uh, uh, psychedelic music and psychedelic art and uh, um, people going to a rock concert taking LSD and uh, um, it, it, and and uh, also the uh, you know uh, the Timothy Leary uh, uh, was a, a, a person he had been a psychologist at Harvard and he became the sort of leader of a movement that that actually encouraged uh, young people to drop out of society and uh, using uh, LSD for that and uh, this was uh, at a time of, of highly uh, uh, conflictual uh, politics in the United States with the Vietnam War and and the civil rights movement and so forth, and uh, um, the, the the establishment simply thought that they cannot have this, they cannot uh, accept this kind of a um, drug to be spread. So they forbid the use of uh, uh, LSD and and all the psychedelics in 1970. And uh, um, also forbid uh, in practice all research uh, uh, about it. And um, there were, you know, some good reasons for that. Uh, if, if you take LSD in, in a rock concert, you know, I, I have friends uh, whose son did that and ended up down in a, in a canyon, uh, has had 57 operations from afterwards. Um, it's, I think, at least now, people realize that, you know, this is not something you should do for fun. Um, and uh, also people, you know, were taking this, oh, it's a great pill, let's see what happens. And then they, would, uh, uh, they were overtaken by very strong um, experiences and visions and so forth and ended up in the emergency room um, shocked and, and uh, not, you know, it's not something I would say that you can take as a pill and see what happens or have fun with. Uh, so um, there are also political reasons, I would say, for, for forbidding the, this and setting an end to this first wave of psychedelics. But part of it was also, you know, a fairly re le legitimate concern about uh, people acting um, uh, in a way that they probably wouldn't like to do themselves. Um, but then came a second wa wave, and these waves, uh, as I outlined in the book, actually happen to coincide with uh, some Mayan uh, calendrical time periods. And uh, in, in the 90s, uh, uh, research were uh, re coming, began to be done again on psychedelics. And then in the past 10 years, it's been a lot of research being permitted to be done and uh, which has shown um, remarkably positive results when it comes to therapy of the uh, addiction, um, therapy of depression, of compulsive obsessive disorders, and uh, other things. And uh, this has been done by quite reputable uh, scientific institutions uh, in England by the Imperial College in London, and um, uh, the UCLA and the Johns Hopkins in the United States. And uh, the, this is under very controlled situations. In other words, somebody is given a psychedelic substance, usually psilocybin, together with therapists in, in a safe setting. Uh, uh, and uh, um, it, it, it turns out that the, in, in this sense, it, it's, it's been highly effective in, in treating these kind of uh, um, mm, uh, mental disorders, if, if you like. Um, so the, the attitude is, is changing. It's still illegal, um, mostly. Uh, there are a couple of uh, cities in the United States, Denver and Oakland, I think, that uh, in practice has decriminalized it. 
uh, the state of Oregon has on the ballot for the election now to legalize it in, in that state. And so th there's a s rapid change in the attitude that people are having. Um, but I would say that uh, today most people would, uh, you know, have a more responsible attitude uh, that, that uh, you know, like ayahuasca, uh, as it's done in, and uh, which I have experienced in the Amazon, is looked upon as a, a sacred r ritual or sacred ceremony. And that kind of sacred uh, attitude, I think, is necessary for the uh, positive effects that these uh, substances may have. Um, but um, uh, I, I think the, the scientific consensus view now is leaning towards uh, the idea that these are very effective uh, um, tools for um, helping mental disorders if they are uh, taken or given in, in, the, in safe circumstances. Yeah, as you say, in sacred, in sacred environments, isn't it? And that's the, yeah. the place where, you know, you're taking it for the right reasons. Yeah. And, you know, you're taking it to perhaps to, you know, to, to, to open or to, you know, to be in the sacred environment. But what makes you so, so in, it's, it's kind of, I'm not, to, to link psychedelics with the Mayan calendar oh, and yeah. link it with the quantum science. So from, from, you know, from all the books that you've written for, for me to have, to have the psychedelics, you know, it was like, Oh, psychedelics with multidimensional reality and Mayan <laughs> calendar. Oh, that's really interesting. It was just like, it didn't seem to go together. So can you explain oh, yeah. the kind of connection for, for, yeah. our, for our readers on that? Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, um, so the, the, the peoples, the indigenous peoples that are using uh, in a shamanic uh, way uh, psychedelics, plants or mushrooms and so forth, they, uh, I think, invariably uh, hold a multidimensional view of reality. And, and they look upon it that this physical reality is, you know, it may be a default state, but in parallel with that exists also spiritual worlds uh, of, of different kinds. And uh, <clears throat> so that's a good starting point because, you know, what, what happens when you, for instance, take ayahuasca is that at a certain point, you, you're actually having experiencing like a quantum leap of consciousness. You're moving into perceiving a, a different kind of world where you could call it spirits. I, I call it spirits. That's fine. That where they have an uh, uh, independent existence. Uh, so uh, now, of course, the ancient Maya, they would also be into mushrooms and, uh, and so forth. And they clearly had a multidimensional uh, view of, of reality. And uh, so what I saw then is that this whole uh, experience of moving into another state of consciousness was actually a function of having downloaded a new uh, or a different geometry from the cosmic center so that you're actually doing a, a quantum leap. The, your, your mind is reorganized because you're starting to resonate with the cosmic center on another uh, frequency. And uh, uh, the, we talked about the one that the eight partitioning that created civilization and, and, and so forth. Now, that gave structure to your mind. It, it, it has the perpendicular geometries that structure a mind. You have a left and a right brain half. They not just mix, so to speak. We, we're thinking through that particular quantum state and geometry. Now, what happens, though, is if you take the, the uh, psychedelics, that disengages that particular geometry. Creation. And uh, as that happens, you become open to all the different waves that are, are emitted from the cosmic center. And as you become open to that, you will start to see things in, in, in a new reality that you wouldn't see with your normal default state of a structured mind that organizes your brain. Um, so it, it really is a, 
it really makes a lot of sense. And it, so far, I, you know, it's the really first scientific theory that, that makes sense of how they work. There's a million books out there that talk about the experience of, of psychedelics, and that's fine. But the, you have to have, I, I think, a multidimensional view. That You have to have a view that reality fundamentally is multidimensional, that it comes out of nine quantum state in, in order to understand how your quantum state can be changed and you become receptive to new and broader information from the cosmic center. Yeah, amazing. Fascinating, fascinating. And, you know, as I say, you're all in, it all interlinks. <coughs> I know from the viewers that are watching this there's a lot of information that has come through this you know from from the you know the, the center of the universe from opening up from following different energies from the creation into into unity into this into the psychedelics and and into the multi-dimensional well we're multi multi-dimensional beings anyway and so i think every single person watching this 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 interview this episode would appreciate that we we are multi multi-dimensional -dim beings so do you have another book in you carl is there something else in the, is something else that you're thinking that oh there's something else i'm gonna <laughs> write about or what's your next step no i don't think so um i mean who knows what what will happen, um, but I'm not really at that place uh, that, that I'm thinking about a new book. Um, at this point, I think there is enough of books that I think should I, I will try to promote and, and make available to people to uh, see a broader worldview than they normally have. Um, then in the, in the future, I, I don't know. Um, the, the books sort of come to me at certain points in time and tell me that I'm supposed to write them. And uh, so far, a new book has come to me since this book was published. Uh, it probably would, if any book will come, um, I would expect it would take at least two years before that happens. Yeah, of course. Waiting for the direct download, that's the thing. And, that, and, that, and that's when we, you know, when we follow guidance. Hit Talks wouldn't be here if it, the download wasn't here, it wasn't, wasn't accepted. And again, again, with your books. So, Carl, where do our viewers find you? Obviously, we will put all the links. We'll put the links to all your fantastic books down in the comments. But um, just briefly, where can people find you if they want to reach out to you and know a little bit about more than what you do? Yeah, well, you know, I have my website, calaman.com. Uh, that's spelled C A L L E M A N dot com. And uh, there people can either contact me, there is a link to writing to me, or they can sit, sign up for a newsletter, or they can uh, go into the uh, exploring the ninth wave, uh, learning about how to connect with this wave. Uh, they can sign up for a course, uh, or, or, and uh, they can also see what books I have, uh, which they can also find at uh, uh, any place where they sell books, whether it's Barnes & Nobles, uh, Amazon, or Inner Traditions. And I have a couple of Facebook pages as well. Um, yeah, we'll put, all, we'll put all the links below. So absolutely fascinating. And then also you can check Carl's website out because there's some amazing blogs in there as well and um, some really deep articles where you can find out a little bit more about the Mayan calendars. You can find out a little bit more about what Carl does. So I urge every single one of you watching this episode of Honest Inner Truth Conversations to really check out Carl's website. So Carl, I'd like to thank you again so much for actually being part of Hit Talk the new creation and obviously with honest inner truths conversation it's a blessing to have you we're here with us continue doing what you're doing changing the world and we will get as many people as we possibly can to read your books to experience the ninth wave understand a little bit about the what the ninth wave and of course the amazing ancient mayan energies that we all have available to us so thank you very much car for having us and thank you to all our viewers here for watching this episode please watch the previous episodes and please look out for the next episodes of honest inner truths and don't forget hit talks the, the talk show where eight people speak for eight minutes on eight different perspectives 
please join us for the next episode. My name is Vicky Thomas. I'm your founder and your host, and I look forward to seeing you at the next episode.